Today, as we come to the table. Now you know why he was so upset with him, but now you know what Barnabas and Paul were facing. And what I love about this is when John Mark went back, they didn't. They said, all right, the odds are against us even more now. Now there's not as many men to fight if we have to. Now there's not an extra set of eyes to watch for all the thieves and robbers. Now there's all these things we have to face on our own. But you know what? God has called us to go to Antioch and preach the gospel. Paul, you know, are you with me? Yes. Barnabas, are you with me? Yes, we're going to Antioch. And that's the spirit and the heart we have to have, guys, as missionaries and those called out for the Lord. If God has called us somewhere, even if the odds seem stacked against us, we need to go because God will be faithful. Has God called you to something? Does it feel like the odds are stacked against you? Pastor Mark shows us through Scripture today that when God has called us, we need to go and not worry about the odds because God is faithful. Well, thanks for staying with us today as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Pastor Mark Kirk of Calvary Knoxville. So when God calls you to go, keep your eyes fixed on Him and not on the problems in front of you. God can take the million to one chance and make it happen. With God on your side, there is nothing you can't do. Take heart today and step into that calling that's too big for you. Take that risk, make that leap of faith, and follow Him, anticipating that He will do great things. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Acts chapter 13 as he begins his message, Meeting People Where They Are. Welcome. Let's open up our Bibles to Acts chapter 13. As we continue on looking at Paul and Barnabas' missionary journey, and we're going to read verse 13 to get a little bit of a run and go, just a couple of verses, and then pray and get into it. Notice in chapter 13, verse 13, Now when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. But when they had departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and they sat down. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you've given us the message that you've given us to share with those around us. And as we look at Paul and Barnabas going into Antioch today and going, Lord, to the Jews and the Gentiles and giving them the good news, what we call the gospel, Lord, you gave them boldness, you gave them clarity, you gave them direction. And I pray that as we get into this passage today, you would do the same thing for us. We need boldness. We need clarity of the message, Lord, that you've given. And Lord, we need direction and how to give that message. And so I pray that as we see the way that you used Paul to share the gospel with the Jews in Antioch and the Gentiles, God, that you would show us a pattern of how we too can share the gospel with those around us here in Knoxville and around the world so that we can be unafraid and we can be prepared and know, Lord, what we're supposed to share and how we're supposed to share it. So, God, I pray now you pour out your spirit on us. You would just minister to your flock. We love you, Lord. We bless you. We thank you. We look forward to what you have for us in your word and by your spirit today. And, Lord, we ask you would just open us up to receive it. God, give us ears to hear and eyes to see. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The gospel, meeting people where they are and knowing how to meet them with the gospel. Guys, this is such an important thing. We hear the term the gospel. And I don't know about you guys, but growing up, I'd hear the gospel. I wasn't quite sure what it was, you know. What's the gospel? I mean, I kind of know what it is. It's just kind of going to church, isn't it? Or it's like maybe sharing Jesus. The gospel simply means good news. And all that means is that we go to people and tell them, look, the bad news is you're separated from God. The good news is God gave his son to die for you to reconnect you. That's the good news. There's the gospel. Now, there's more to it. He died on the cross. He resurrected the third day, and you've got to confess your sins and believe. But I think sometimes knowing the gospel is not enough because we have to know how to present the gospel. And what today is all about is meeting people where they are. That is, who are you talking to? And we're going to see Paul and Barnabas, and Paul really do a masterful job in this because as he goes to the Jews, he's going to meet the Jews right where they are. And there's also going to be Gentiles there, and he's going to be meeting the Gentiles where they are. And the thing that Paul was so good at that we need to learn to do is Paul was, he had not only the spiritual preparation to do what God had called him to do, but he had the mental preparation to do what God had called him to do. And what do I mean by that? He knew his audience. 
Who am I talking to? You know, if you guys go to share the gospel with somebody here in Knoxville, you're probably going to be natural at it. These are your people. You understand the culture. You understand how we think. You know that probably if you can work some football in there, you've at least got their ear. You understand your culture. You understand the mindset, and then you lead them to the cross through that. But what happens if you go somewhere else in the country? Or what happens if you go on a missions trip? Or what happens if you begin to share with the Hispanic community in our area or the growing Arabic community in our area? We can't walk up to the Arabic people that have just moved over here from Saudi Arabia and Iraq and share with them the same way you can a Knoxvillian. Is everybody with me on that? You've got to recognize they believe different things. We have to go where they are. We don't diminish the truth, but we go where they are and we begin to show them from the word of God and from what they believe, how Jesus Christ is the answer. The son of God died, rose again the third day, and we lead them to the Lord through that. Now, I know it's the work of the Holy Spirit. I understand that. But if you don't understand a little bit of who I'm talking to, you're not going to be ready. You know, if I'm asked to speak to a Calvary Chapel, I know how I'm supposed to speak to a Calvary Chapel. They're pretty much the same all the way around the world. But if I'm asked to go to a Methodist church or go to a Baptist church, still believers, if I'm asked to go to some other, I need to know the way to approach them. I need to know the mindset. How do they think? How do they approach the Bible? How do they approach? And then I come from the angle that they will understand. When you talk to a child, you talk like a child. When you talk to an adult, you talk to them like an adult. When you talk to different groups, you need to understand that. And Paul today, when he goes to Antioch, realizes he's talking to Jews. That's his native language. So he's going to be very natural at sharing the gospel here. We're going to see certain things that he includes in sharing the gospel that we need to incorporate as well. But he's also got what they call the God-fearers, which were the Gentiles. Now, this is the way the synagogues were set up. If this was a synagogue today, you would come into church, and all the people would be here in the church that were the Jews, if you will, in the synagogue. But if you weren't a Jew, you couldn't come in. You would stay in an area back there called the God-fearers. Now, it's not that way in the Jewish synagogues today, but it was in that day. And so if you were back there, what you were as a God-fearer is you were a Gentile who didn't want to convert to Judaism because you didn't want to follow the law. But even though you didn't want to convert to Judaism and follow the law, you believed in the Jewish God. So you wanted to seek the Jewish God. So you would stay in the area, we might say like the foyer, called the God-fearers. And of course, the doors would be open and you could hear everything that was going on. Paul is going to address all of them today and he's going to reach the Jews where they are. But he's also going to reach the God-fearers where they are and share scripture that God didn't just come for the Jews. He came for the Gentiles as well. And in that day, they were teaching that God only came for the Jews. No, we have to recognize, guys, that God came for everyone. Even if their culture is not like ours, even if their belief system is not like ours, he died for everyone. Our job is to build a bridge, find out where they're coming from, who they are, how do I reach them, and then begin to reach them. And again, Paul was a master at this because of his upbringing. Uh, because he, he was raised a Jew, but he was raised in a Roman and a Greek culture. And uh, he was the perfect man for the job. And although we may not be the perfect one for the job in many different ways in our own mind, God can still teach us and we can still learn how to reach people around us. How do you reach the people in your office? Understand what their mindset is. How do you reach the people at school? Understand what their mindset is. You, know, you can't walk in and say certain things to certain groups. You're going to shut them down. You have to know how to work your way in. Again, I shared with you last week, masterfully, how Billy Graham went in the synagogue. And I know since you've shared me to a synagogue, you want to hear about Jesus because you know that I'm a proclaimer of Jesus. So now I'm going to share with you about Jesus, his death on the cross, and his resurrection. How do you get mad at him, right? That's what they called him there to do. But you have to have that bridge you can build to get that door open to go. Paul's going to build that bridge, and we need to learn to recognize who it is we're talking to and begin to build that bridge to them as well. Because if we don't, We're not going to be able to reach them. So just remember that and keep that mindset uh, in your mind. You know, Paul, when he spoke to the Jews, was as a Jew. When he spoke to the Greeks, as a Greek. The Romans, as a Roman. You get the idea. And uh, so we saw that they had the mental preparation as much as they had the spiritual preparation. Now, again, remember, we saw here in verse 13 last week that as they left and departed to go to this new area, when they set sail from Paphos, actually, they came to Perga Pamphylia. Notice John Mark departed from them. Why do I bring that up? Because we need to have a little bit of background of why this was such a big deal to Paul. We're going to see later this was a huge thing to Paul, so much that Paul didn't want to even travel with John Mark anymore, didn't want to do ministry with John Mark anymore. And since John Mark was the nephew of Barnabas, then Barnabas and Paul split apart. And why? Well, understand when they traveled from Jerusalem over to Cyprus and they shared with the proconsul there, we saw that last week. Then they sailed from Cyprus over to what we would call today, and this is where we take up today, the coast of Turkey. 
modern day Turkey. They went to that region right there. And as they're getting ready to travel up toward Antioch, understand what they're facing. They're facing a hundred mile journey uphill through mountains. And it was known to be infested with thieves and robbers. In other words, if you travel that area, you better have a lot of people with you. You better have your weapons ready to go. You better have people watching at night when you camped and you slept. It would have been a 100-mile trip. If you were traveling quickly, that would be about 20 miles a day. So five days at the fastest, probably more like a week, even for men taking their time or whatever. And so you always had these people watching at night. You, you always had to be on your guard, everything through this dangerous, robber-infested area. Picture it like swimming through shark-infested waters. If you're in shark-infested waters, you like some kind of cage around you as you're trying to swim from here to Cuba or whatever you're trying to do, right? And if you don't, you realize I'm in big trouble, and you at least want somebody in the boat watching or some workers. I wouldn't want somebody in the boat. I'd want people down in the water with, like, bazookas watching as I swim across there, but that's just me. But anyway, so now you have Paul and Barnabas and John Mark, and they're about to cross 100 miles over about a week's journey to go and share the gospel where God has called them in their second stop in a shark-infested waters, Robber thieve infested territory, if you will. And John Mark says, uh, guys, you know what? I think I'm just going to head on back. What? What do you mean heading on back? We need another set of eyes. We need somebody to tear camp down and put camp up and watch during the night. We need somebody, if they see us coming around a the corner, there's at least three men and not just two. We need some kind of deterrent here. What do you mean you're going on? I just, it's not working, guys. I'm out of here. And he leaves. Now you know why he was so upset with him. But now you know what Barnabas and Paul were facing. And what I love about this is when John Mark went back, they didn't. They said, all right, the odds are against us even more now. Now there's not as many men to fight if we have to. Now there's not an extra set of eyes to watch for all the thieves and robbers. Now there's all these things we have to face on our own. But you know what? God has called us to go to Antioch and preach the gospel. Paul, you know, are you with me? Yes. Barnabas, are you with me? Yes, we're going to Antioch. And that's the spirit and the heart we have to have, guys, as missionaries and those called out for the Lord. If God has called us somewhere, even if the odds seem stacked against us, we need to go because God will be faithful. And I've seen going out on the mission field, I've done many missions trips. I've watched God be faithful no matter the odds. I've seen some things that were pretty freaky at times, quite honestly, and I've watched God pull through in amazing ways because God is faithful. And if God calls you to do something, God's going to give you what you need to be able to do it. And I love it about Paul and Barnabas because they were not going to give up. They're going to do what God's called them to do. And they're, they're heading no matter what. And here they go. Now, it's interesting because you read it in Galatians, Paul talking about the fact that he got sick uh, when he was in that region. And this is the Galatia region. And they loved him so much, they would have taken out their own eyes and given them to him if they could. That's why many people believe that Paul's eyes were the issue. Some believe that he had malaria. Malaria was rampant in this area. But now imagine on top of this, many believe because of what Paul says, Paul says in perils of water, you know, in, in perils of fasting, in perils of nakedness, in perils of prison, in perils of thieves and robbers, I have presented the gospel. It would appear that Paul did get jumped at some point. He got robbed. Something happened to him. And he's talking about all the perils. Many believe that it happened right here because this was such a bad area for all the robbers. Now imagine John Mark's gone. You're down to two guys. You're crossing this territory. You get robbed. And we don't know for sure it happened here, but it might have. But others even believe this is where he caught either malaria or his eye condition. That was his thorn in the flesh. And if scholars are right and all of these things happened at this time, think about what a tough missionary journey this was. Had to go, Paul, you know. You know, what happened? Well, I caught malaria, went blind, and was robbed several times. You know I mean? I mean, I don't know. Want to go with me next time? <laughs> God's doing a work, you know, right? Why do I say that? Because God was doing a work. And God saved many people in Antioch, and churches were planted in that whole region because of Paul's faithfulness. Guys, we have to be willing to do and go wherever God tells us to go for the sake of the gospel. And that might mean that sometimes we go through difficult times. It's not easy to go down to Haiti. It's not easy to go into some of the places that you go on missionary journeys, but if God's called you to do it, God will be faithful to help you, and God will use you in that. Yes, you may even get sick sometimes, but you know what? These bodies are wearing out anyway, and you're not going anywhere until God says you're going to go, and the neat thing is, I was saying this to somebody else. I was speaking to somebody that was very elderly, and they're having kind of a tough time getting around, and I said, you know, aren't you glad that in Christ we get a new model, you know, and he just began to laugh, and he said, yes. It'll be great. You know, it's just great to get a brand new model, you know, and to have something that's going to last forever. Don't put your stake in this body. Don't put your stake in this world. Thank God for the blessings we have in our bodies that work, in this world that works, and the parts that do, you know, as we get older that still work. But the bottom line is we're getting a new one. And right now we need to leave it all on the field for the Lord. We give it all to Him. 
Pretty dramatic layout for this as we get into it. Notice what happens as we go here. Verse 14, they get ready to head now on up into Turkey. It says, but when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia, and they went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and they sat down. Now that verse just tells you, that one verse contains everything I just told you. The hundred mile journey, the robbers, the perils, all the sickness, all that. They don't say much about it, do they? You know, just there it is. If indeed it all happened during that time, we know the journey part did, but the other part we don't know for sure. But either way, we don't see any whining or complaining. We simply see that they traveled on and they went to do what God had called them to do. And notice they followed his normal pattern that Paul did everywhere. First, on the Sabbath day, he went to the Jews. And then after he went to the Jews, where did he go? Then he went over to the Gentiles. He would always follow that pattern because the Bible says that the gospel was to the Jew first because the promise of the Messiah was to the Jew and then after the Jew either heard it, received it, and or even rejected it, then the Gentile was now to hear the gospel. So Paul follows this pattern, and today he's going to actually be doing both. He'll speak to the Jews initially in their synagogue, but the god fears are going to be there, and so he's going to be speaking to them as well. But notice here, he goes to Antioch. They're in Pisidia. It's interesting to me, Antioch means literally driven against, and Pisidia means tarry, as in sticky tar. And I find that interesting because you know me, I'm always looking for the Holy Spirit making his point. And it really struck me as I read this that God will oftentimes, and I've seen this in my life, God will oftentimes send us to sticky places where we are actively driven against in opposition to share the gospel. And sometimes I think, Lord, this is a sticky situation. You know, this family's about to get in a fight and kill each other. Why am I here, you know? <laughs> Maybe we should call the police. I found myself in some very interesting situations over the years, and I know God has put me there. And God will be, begin to say, and I'll say this, I'll share the gospel, and I'll do that. And I, you think, why would God put you in a sticky place? Why would God put you somewhere where you're driven against and there's opposition? There's always, you know, Uncle Harry or somebody in the room that doesn't want to hear it, right? And the others are trying to, and they're interfering. Listen, God does this because it's sticky places and opposition where the lost are. And if we don't go to those places, how are we going to reach them? We can't just come to church every Sunday and reach Knoxville. Is everybody with me? We have to take the gospel out into Knoxville. We've got to take it in our workplace. We've got to take it in the malls and everywhere that we go, we've got to take it. And even if it's a sticky situation, you know, and you think you're going to get opposition, at least put it out there. You never know what will happen. Um, it's not because God hates us or wants us to have a hard time, but he says, this is where the lost are. And you've got to go. You know, if you're going to go and help people out of the ditch, you've got to get a little bit of mud on you, don't you? And how many of us came out of the ditch already? And somebody came and pulled us out of the ditch. And now it's our turn to go and get a little bit of mud back on us. You know, don't worry, that lamb's wool will wash off. Get in the shower, get going, pray to the Lord, and get going again. Be his witness and his testimony. And so they go there on the Sabbath day, they sit down, verse 15. And notice after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them or, uh, to say, Men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people... Say on. Now, a little bit of history is needed here. Here's the way the synagogue would operate. You had these different leaders of the synagogue. You had the high priest led over all the synagogues. Then you had the chief of the priests, who was the number two guy, and he was over all the priests in all the synagogues around the world. And then you had what was called the ruler of the synagogue. He would be like the local pastor in authority, I guess you would say. And he was third in command in the nation of Israel as far as their spiritual positions would go. And the ruler of the synagogue, the high priest wouldn't typically be there. The chief of the priests wouldn't be there. But every synagogue had a ruler of the synagogue. So the ruler of the synagogue would get up and he or someone would read from the scriptures what the reading was for that day. And then when they were done with the service part of reading from the scriptures, they would say, all right, anyone in here that has a word from the Lord or something you want to say to us, stand up and say it. And then they would stand up and speak. So this was part of the normal structure of the synagogue of that day. Paul now, of course, takes advantage of that because Paul knew this was a part of the structure and Paul's just waiting, you know. He sits through the service or whatever. He waits for his chance to get up and spread the gospel and here he goes. And by the way, when you tell Paul to speak, there's not much more you have to do. <laughs> then Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said this, again, very demonstrative, men of Israel, note this, and you who fear God. The two categories, remember I told you about. The Jews that were right in front of him and those that were out there, what we would say in the foyer, the, the God-fearers who were also listening to this. So Paul, is, he starts off automatically by getting meeting his audience where they are. The God-fearers realized they were the outcasts. It was really for the Jews that everybody was at church. And yet the Jews were so nice, they'd let them sit in in the back. Paul didn't address it that way. Paul, first thing, said this. Everybody in here in the main sanctuary and those of you who are not allowed past those doors. 
I come to tell you some good news because the gospel is for everyone. Does everybody understand that? There's nobody that the gospel is not for. It doesn't matter what culture, what country, what background. There's a group called the Dalits in India, and they're considered the untouchables. The untouchables. Nobody. They believe, of course, in reincarnation in India, and they believe that these people are the worst of the worst in reincarnation. The reason they're a part of the Dalit group is because they were either murderers or rapists or adulterers or whatever. this. And so they say, you have gotten what you deserve. You were born again in this horrible situation because you deserve it. How exciting it has been to see the gospel through Gospel for Asia and others go to the Dalits and say, you are special to God. He loves you. He died for you. And you can receive the kingdom of God if you just believe. And they see they have purpose and somebody loves them. That's what Paul was doing. The god may not have been as bad as the Dalits today, but they, the Jews had nothing to do with them. They let them come, but they wouldn't even let them in. The Jews believed the Gentiles were created to keep hell burning. In their writings, it says that we, non-Jews, which are what Gentiles are, we were created by God because there had to be something to make hell burn. So we were created and we're the ones who were going to be there burning it while they were up in heaven, right? That was the viewpoint. Now Paul starts out saying, men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. Now he's got the ears of everybody in the audience. How did he do that? He knew his audience. He knew Jews would be there. He knew God fears. Guys, when you go to share the gospel, find out who's going to be there. Reach them where they are. Speak their language. He says, listen, the God of this people Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. With an uplifted arm, he brought them out of it. So he, he now begins to go into their history. He says, I'm going to reach the Jews where they are, but I'm going to tell their history, remind them of their history, remind them that God promised through David a Messiah, show them that David was not the one that they were looking to, but a one to come after. He's not the one in the, the Gospels that it talks about, never saw corruption, but Jesus who would rise from the dead, and he's going to bring the Gospel in through their very foundation and their belief system. He says, now for a time of about 40 years, <laughs> I love this, he put up with their ways in the wilderness. Boy, did he ever. <laughs> These guys were, were, were really hard to put up with. But God's been faithful to put up with us, hadn't he? Some of you this morning, God's been putting up with you. And maybe you feel it. You know, God, I know that you should have condemned me a long time ago. I should be dead by now. How many of you guys, by the time you came to the Lord, realized you should already be dead? Anybody else besides me? I realized I should have been dead. I had many opportunities to die and actually created most of them myself. And I look back at how God saved me, how God rescued me physically so that I could be saved spiritually. Some of you guys, God has simply kept you alive till today so you can hear the gospel. I was talking with Tracy about somebody the other day that's living longer than we ever thought they would live. And, and her comment is always the same, and it's right on target. It is God's grace giving them more time so they might repent and be saved. Because there's no other reason that person would be alive. Some of you today, maybe the only reason you didn't get killed in that car accident Maybe the only reason that disease didn't take you down, maybe the only reason whatever happened in your life is because God said, I'm going to give him another chance. I'm going to bring him to Calvary Chapel and I'm going to let him hear this message and I'm bringing them today. I'm picking today to do it. This is their chance. If they'll respond and receive Jesus Christ, I will save them. And that may be you guys. If that's you, God is calling you this morning. Don't leave this place without making that decision. And just like that, another time at the table of God's Word has come to an end. The accounts of this book end up being the types of storylines that directors long for in a good plot of an underdog overcoming the odds and doing more than people would ever expect. But like many stories, they don't always have a happy ending, at least here on Earth. Pastor Mark will continue teaching through the book of Acts next time. But you don't have to wait until then to listen to more great Bible studies. You can access this series in the Come to the Table section on thewaymedia.net. Feel free to share these messages with anyone who wants to know more about what the Bible has to say. You can also download the Way Media app to access teachings as they're available. If you live in the Knoxville area, you're invited to join Pastor Mark and the community of Jesus followers at Calvary Knoxville for our next service. For nearly 25 years, it's been incredible to see how God God has used us in our local community and through this radio outreach. There's always a seat for you. We meet Saturdays at 6 p.m., Sunday mornings at 8, 9.30, or 11.15, and in the evening again at 6. We also gather Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. If you can't make it in person, that's not a problem. You can join us online. We're streaming our services through the Way Media app. To find out more info on Calvary Knoxville, scroll to the bottom of the waymedia.net to find a link to our church website. 
Pastor Mark has more to share, so be sure to join us as we prepare to come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville. 